Welcome to NWA DC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Christian Ramers to introduce our speaker today. David Spock really needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, David Spock is our clinical director at the AETC, a professor of medicine in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and one of our clinician teachers at the Madison Clinic. Today he's going to talk about HIV drug resistance. Okay, well, what I'd like to do for the topic today is to really focus on issues related to resistance testing. There will be a session next week that will focus more on the approaches to patients who actually have resistance in terms of the interpreting the resistance testing and what we do with that information. But today I'm going to focus on the, the approach to resistance testing. I think the first issue to address is when should we be doing resistance testing? And for clinicians, they should be aware there are five major indications for resistance testing. The first is patients who have acute HIV infection. And with those situations, you actually want to order a genotype. The second is individuals who have chronic infection but have never been on therapy. And again, you order a genotype. That's probably the second most common clinical time when we do resistance testing. The third is individuals who have virologic failure. That's by far the most common time when we do resistance testing. It's recommended to do resistance testing if the viral load is above 1,000 in the setting of virologic failure. Consider if it's above 500 but between uh, 500 and 1,000. And it is recommended to consider integrase genotyping when a person is failing an integrase strand transfer inhibitor, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And also it's recommended to consider adding a phenotype when you have situations with suspected complex drug resistance patterns, particularly in patients who've been on long-term protease inhibitors, and I'll come back to that again. Uh, the fourth indication is individuals that you start on antiretroviral therapy and they just don't suppress after a reasonable amount of time, say six months to nine months. The last but not least are individuals who are HIV infected and pregnant. Uh, it's recommended in that situation to do a genotype prior to starting antiretroviral therapy. If they're already on therapy, they're suppressed, obviously there's no reason uh, to do a genotype in that setting. And one of the questions that comes up is why should we order a genotype in someone who's never received antiretroviral therapy? In other words, if they've never been on therapy, why would they have developed resistance and why should you even bother checking it? Well, conceptually, what everyone should understand is that people can transmit drug-resistant virus. The individual on your left-hand side is depicting someone who has a mixture of wild-type HIV and resistant strains of HIV. At the time they pass on their virus, they may pass on a resistant strain and possibly a multi-resistant strain. The individual on the right has acquired a resistant strain. So even though that individual on the right has never seen and been on antiretroviral therapy, they have acquired a drug-resistant strain. So that's the intuitive reason for why we do resistance testing, even if an individual has never been on antiretroviral therapy. There's some data from San Francisco looking at individuals with acute or early <coughs> HIV infection over a sustained period of time from 2002 to 2009. And they looked at individuals that had any type of resistance. And you can see from this graphic that it's a significant amount of resistance. Um, and these are individuals that probably have a little bit higher levels because they were detected very early in the course of their HIV infection. But you can see in the last several years of the study, you know, ranging, you know, 24%, 15%, 15%, so significant resistance. This is a CDC study that looked at a little bit different group of patients. It looked at individuals not necessarily in the acute or early setting, but individuals that were newly diagnosed. Now, they could have been newly diagnosed and had HIV three, four, five years. Um, in looking at this, there was resistance to any class of drug in about 16% of the patients. So this is a widely quoted study that where everybody was saying, you know, approximately one out of six individuals that has HIV who's never been treated has a resistant uh, virus, resistant to some class of drug. What you can see from the study to the class of drugs where the most resistance was seen were the NNRTIs, which is uh, not unexpected given the wide use of that class and the low genetic barrier resistance. So another question that comes up, well, why not just wait and order the genotype when the patient is actually going to start the antiretroviral therapy? Well, why do that up front? Well, conceptually to go through this, when an individual acquires a drug-resistant strain, this is showing you that the, the, the viral RNA can have multiple mutations on it. And 
as an individual is analyzed early in the course, um, the, 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 if you analyze the reverse transcriptase, protease, and integrase resistance, you may see multiple resistant uh, ice, uh, uh, on the genotype, multiple, multiple resistant mutations on the genotype. So as time goes on, what can happen is the virus can back mutate and essentially the wild type virus can become increasingly dominant and take over the resistant strains. So as you go over time, kind of going from top to bottom here, you can see that the virus evolves and some of the resistant isolates may move to the background. They're, they're what we call archive virus. So if you're going to get your highest yield, the sooner after infection that you order the genotype, the better. And that's the logic for obtaining it as soon as a person enters care with you. Now, how do you interpret the genotype? This is a really practical question. One way to get the interpretation is to consult an expert, and that's, that's a very valid way to do it. But another way is to, to understand some, some resources that you can apply. First of all, understanding basically what's happening. The mutation occurs originally in the sequence of the DNA of the virus. It occurs when there's replication of the DNA. The analysis in the genotype is analyzing the DNA. But what we see when we look at the report is that they extrapolate and they give us the amino acid mutation. And that's easy to do. If you know the, the, the genetic material and you know that, that certain codons are, are linked to or, or that represent amino acids, you can easily d discern what mutation will cause a certain amino acid mutation. That amino acid mutation, in turn, can lead to a protein change which may impact, for example, the binding of your drug to the pocket of the enzyme. So the way this is represented on the report is that the position of the amino acid is what's represented. The wild type or original amino acid is represented first, then the position, and then the newly mutated amino acid. So for example, in this example, the K at the amino acid position 103 has been replaced by an N. And the way that it looks on the lingo that you see on the reports are you see a K103N mutation. And just to emphasize, the K is the wild type amino acid, the 103 is the amino acid position, the N is the mutant amino acid. And, and I put down here, for, for those of you that are interested, the, the overall length of these amino acids in the different enzymes. The reverse transcriptase is a very large enzyme up to, it's 156 amino, I mean, I'm sorry, 560 amino acids. The protease, fairly small, only 99 amino acids. So the mutations that you see are going to be in that range. Now, where are some particularly good resources? If you look at the International Antiviral Society USA, they have an excellent chart that if you've never looked at is a great resource. Go to their homepage, look on the far left hand where you see the drug resistance uh, mutations, and then go under the most resistant revision, I'm sorry, the most recent revision. And if you click on that, what you'll do is you'll get a document that should be able to show um, a graphic that basically outlines the, the, the map of what you can see for the common mutations. It's very easy to understand because basically they have all the drugs listed, they have the amino acids, they have the, the mutation changes, and you can get a visual for the different drugs for where the mutations occur. Another excellent site, if you've not used it, is the Stanford database. What you do is you go to the Stanford uh, database website, is noted there. You click on that upper right-hand side where it has the uh, database program, and then you get to this page, and then you choose your method. You can either enter the entire sequence, which we don't do clinically. What you do clinically is you'll enter a protease or RT mutations. You can also do integrase. And then you basically, with the drop-down menu, throw in your mutations on this. You click at the bottom, uh, analyze, and you get a report back. And it tells you really what these mutations mean for your patient. So it's an excellent resource. Now, the, one of the questions that comes up is how and when should you order an integrase genotype? To clarify, an integrase genotype is not part of your standard genotype when you order it from all commercial assays now, unfortunately. I personally think it should be. It's very easy to add in the genotype for the integrase, but they're not incorporated in current assays. 
So what you get in your current assay is you basically get an analysis of the genes that will tell you what's going on with the reverse transcriptase and the protease. Now the reverse transcriptase, you get basically your NRT, N, NRTIs and your NNRTI information off of that sequencing, but you do not get an integrase off this standard. So when should you order the integrase genotype? If you're truly thinking about using an integrase up front, and it's possible this person could have been exposed to an integrase, um, a, a, an individual who may have been on an integrase and had transmitted resistant integrase, it would be reasonable to order it in that setting. But the real indication, the common indication to do it, is an individual who's on, for example, raltegravir, integrase strand transfer inhibitor, and they're failing that regimen, that's the time when you really want to make sure and get an integrase genotype. That information is like gold because we're going to have second and probably third generation integrase inhibitors. Knowing these original mutations will be very, very useful for your patient down the road when newer integrase inhibitors come out. What are the ones that are available? There's the genotype through Quest, through LabCorp, through Verco, and we actually have one here locally at the University of Washington. There are phenotypes that are available through LabCorp and Verco. My opinion is the phenotype is not a test you should be ordering. The information you want is the genotype because telling you whether or not it's resistant, yes, no, with the phenotype isn't the information you want. You want to know what the specific mutations are because when you go to choose a second or third integrase inhibitor down the road several years from now, you want to be able to know what those original mutations were because we'll, we'll have information uh, regarding the response of these newer integrase inhibitors. Now, when do you order phenotype? I think you really have to get a feel for this, and the bottom line for this is rarely should you order a phenotype. It is not a standard test that you should routinely be doing. It is not necessary. The one circumstance where I think it's highly valuable is an individual who's highly, highly experienced. They've been on at least two or three different protease inhibitors. They have multiple, multiple mutations. And lining up and looking at, you know, 20 different numbers of mutations, you can discern a lot of information. But what you really want to know is with all these mutations there, is anything really going to work? When you throw the drugs and the bugs together, is anything going to work? And I think when you have such complexity, that's when the phenotype is actually highly valuable. So in the last minute, let me just mention one advanced topic, and it's the issue of minority quasi-species. And this may be new to some of you. The idea with minority quasi-species is that an individual could have a very, very small population of virus in their body that's resistant that really isn't an issue until you jump in with the treatment. For example, if you treat this individual with tenofovir emtricitabine efavirenz or Truvada, and they initially look like they're going to respond great, but you don't knock off that resistant strain shown in pink here, over time what can happen is that pink strain or the resistant strain wins out and becomes the dominant strain and your medications no longer work. Well, well, what does the conventional genotype do? The conventional genotype measures virus that's present in at least 20% of the species. So for example, shown in this graphic, the brown or wild type is easily going to be detected in your genotype. The blue will be detected, but the, the very small minority population shown in orange and blue here will not be picked up on a conventional bulk sequencing that we do. And over time, as shown here, what could happen is that minority variant that wasn't evident on a genotype could become more dominant. So there's a concept now that people are talking about that we may see in the future, which is looking at minority variant sequencing. It's kind of the ultra-sensitive genotype. And we don't have that really on a widespread basis now, but we may someday. And the idea is that these detect all the way down to 1%. So look out for this in the future. We don't know the clinical relevance of this yet, but if you hear the term minority variant sequencing, you'll have a sense of what this is.